This oral history interview of Patrick Hurley, former majority leader of the Kansas House of Representatives, is being conducted under the sponsorship of the Kansas Oral History Project Incorporated, a nonprofit corporation created for the purpose of establishing an archive of oral histories of Kansas state legislators who served prior to the year 2000. These interviews are funded in part by a grant from the Kansas Humanities Council. Professor Ed Flingey of Wichita State University is conducting this interview at the Kansas State House in Topeka, Kansas on March 23, 2018. Audio and visual services are being provided by the Chapman Center for Rural Studies at Kansas State University under the direction of Tom Parrish. Mr. Hurley, originally from Mount Leavenworth has worked as an attorney and an independent contractor representing clients before the Kansas legislature for most of his career. He graduated from Benedictine College in 1963 and Washburn School of Law in 1967. He was first elected to the Kansas House of Representatives in 1974 and re-elected twice but resigned his seat in 1979 to serve as Secretary of the Kansas Department of Administration in the administration of Governor John Carlin. He served as Majority Leader of the Kansas House in the 1977 and 78 legislative sessions. Is that reasonably accurate? That is accurate, yes. Good. Well, you have um, a wide-ranging career, and uh, uh, we want to cover as much of that as possible. All right. And um, why don't we start out by just asking what motivated you to run for the Kansas legislature in 1974? <laughs> well, uh, actually, uh, I had never given it any thought at all. Um, I was uh, practicing law and raising a family and um, had only been in private practice three or four years by then after having served with the federal government. and. Um, about 10 days before the filing deadline, um, I got a, a series of calls, first from uh, the executive director of the Democrat Party saying that everybody said I was the one that could beat the incumbent. At state level? Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. Ron Smith, and, uh, I didn't, whom I didn't know. And I said, I don't have any interest in running. And they said, well, uh, don't let that, they kept saying, don't let that be your last answer. <laughs> and uh, so a day or two later, I get a call from another, at that time, total stranger, Jim Slattery. Same pitch, you know, people tell us you can beat the incumbent, uh, and so we want you to run. And uh, again, I said, no, I'm not interested. Then Now, Jim would have been in the legislature. He was. The yeah. Kansas legislature. Yes, he time. was. And uh, so then I get a call. The next call I get a day or so later is a fellow named John Carlin. Same pitch, you know, and uh, my same answer. <laughs> I'm not interested, but I'll find somebody. And uh, so the next time I talked to him, it was Pete Lux that called me. <laughs> and I said, well, I've got a guy that uh, once served as a Democrat in that seat, and he's interested in filing, so thanks for all the calls, but I won't be filing. And um, uh, then the guy calls me, he was a friend of mine, and he was the head of the Leavenworth County um, Health Department, uh, City County Health Department. He said, well, the Attorney General's office called me and said that um, I'd be violating the Hatch Act 
because we got some federal funding, which I later found out was not an accurate <laughs> characterization. And uh, so I had told them, well, this guy's going to run, so I'm not filing. And, um, but then, you know, when he calls me to say I can't run now because of the Hatch Act, um, I, I didn't say yet that I would, but um, uh, I finally did. And long and short of that, um, I filed about 11 o'clock uh, on the last day when they cut off at noon. And uh, they had promised me two things. One, I would have no opposition in the primary, and they would raise money for me. And so uh, I go back to my law office, get a call asking if I know so-and-so. And I said, yes, he's the guy that I wanted to get to run uh, who has served in that seat before. And why? Well, he filed 15 minutes after you did. And I said, well, uh, I think I can beat him. And then he said, well, do you also know so-and-so? And I said, yeah, he held the seat about 10 years ago. Why? He filed right after the other person filed. So anyway, I ended up having to defeat two uh, former legislators in the primary and the incumbent in the general, and I didn't get a dime of <laughs> financial support to help. But um, I was young enough that uh, went door to door in the primary, door to door, and I didn't do it just Democrats. I did it every door. And um, because my family went back so more than 100 years on both sides in Leavenworth, um, seemed like almost every door I knocked on, if they didn't know me, they knew my cousins or, or my parents or something. So anyway, that's how I got in. I really had never, ever given any thought whatsoever to running. Sounds like a full court press. Uh, how did you get on their radar? Um, I later learned that a very, very good friend of mine whom I had grown up with uh, that later became Chief Justice of the Kansas Supreme Court, Bob Davis, um, had recommended me uh, and uh, said, you know, I've known him all my life and I think he can uh, defeat the incumbent. and. Uh, so I, I had Bob to thank for uh, all these calls I was getting. And I also later learned as I, through my years in politics, that um, if the first guy tells you no, then the next guy you call, you say, everybody says you're the guy that can win the seat. So anyway, it's... Uh, uh, hundred years, was there any political history in the family? No, um, not that I am aware or recall, but um, I, uh, again, my, I know my father's family went back to the 1860s, and uh, my mother's went back to the early 1900s, and um, I had a lot of cousins, an awful lot of relatives, um, not all in my district, uh, a lot out in the county, but uh, because they had lived there and grown up themselves there, uh, truly I, I seem to you know, know about everybody in the city and, and uh, was practicing law there and so Were forth. Were you a, a committed Democrat? I uh, uh, had been. Um, First president I was old enough to vote for was uh, John F. Kennedy, and I had the good fortune of, of getting to see him in person and hear him speak uh, when I was uh, in college. Uh, he was speaking in Kansas City, and uh, carloads went down from what was then St. Benedict's, all boys, now it's Benedict. Um, and, uh, from then on, uh, I just was kind of hooked to politics, it seemed like. You're, you win, uh, defeat uh, uh, 
there was a Republican incumbent yes, too, right? Uh, as well as the primary. Yes, that's right. And uh, uh, was there some issue in the campaign? Uh, yes, there. There was one issue um, aside from people's familiarity with either me or my family. Um, the incumbent worked for the Leavenworth School District. He's, he was a friend of mine, and he, he's deceased now, long deceased. Um, but he, uh, having worked for the school district uh, and still was working for them, was against due process for teachers. And um, if you remember Bob Wooten, Bob was with KNEA then, and they came over and interviewed me. and. Uh, uh, Basically, I said, well, if I run, or this may have been after I filed even, um, I want two things to happen. One, um, teachers in every audience where we jointly appear, and two, to be asked the question as to my position on due process for teachers. And uh, that occurred every place we jointly spoke. And my answer always was, as a lawyer, I can't imagine denying due process to anyone. And the incumbent struggled for any kind of answer that sounded at least that logical and uh, uh, never could come up with a good answer. Well, it doesn't sound like you went into this without some political savvy and skills? I think it was more the legal training. Um, I had tried a lot of cases. The five years I was with the federal government, um, I had the good fortune, I had an awful lot of good fortune in my life, things happening by happenstance, but um, because I went to work with the federal government in the middle of, of a school year in January, um, I was assigned to the designated trial attorney, whereas all these other young attorneys were doing uh, work that never got them into a courtroom. And so I was in a courtroom the whole five years and um, then got called by judges within a month of going into private practice in Leavenworth to take some major cases out of the penitentiaries or what have you. So I had had a lot of, uh, an awful lot of trial work, and um, you know that gives you an advantage, uh, I think, and the, the education does. And this person that I ran against was educated as well, but uh, that seemed to be an issue that would make a difference. So you're in the legislature, um Bennett is Governor, McGill is Speaker. Um, what do you remember about the first two years? You're a backbencher, you're a freshman. Yeah, that's correct. You're not supposed to speak or uh, anything, are you? Well, no, uh, and I learned that pretty quickly too, that um, you could uh, speak too much and uh, then people paid no attention to you, so I was selective about uh, when I would go down and what issues I would address, but uh, I had the experience of, um, do you want me to tell a story that I was telling you at lunch? Uh, I think you should. Okay, well, um, I, I'm, being a Democrat, I was in the, the minority those first two years, and um, we were advised that uh, there was going to be a debate on a bill uh, that would give the attorney general, who was a Democrat, or excuse me, give legislative counsel the same powers that the attorney general uh, had by statute. And the attorney general was a Democrat, so the Republican majority was going to run a bill. And, and they were only going to allow one person to speak from each side of the aisle. And uh, the majority leader, then majority leader of the House, a sen uh, Representative Everett from Manhattan, was, uh, who's a lawyer, was going to speak for the Republicans. I was asked by the minority leader to be the spokesperson uh, for the Democrat side of, 
the issue. And so I went to the law library here and uh, did all kinds of research and brought all kinds of books down with me. And I took it very seriously. Uh, the uh, majority leader, who was a good friend, did not take it <laughs> that seriously. And uh, so I was grilling him and interrogating him and the whole body explaining different powers that the Attorney General had that made no sense for our legislative council, whom, by the way, I had also talked to and didn't really want the bill <laughs> passed. And uh, so then when they voted, it was a straight party line vote. Um, but interestingly, I, uh, when I went back to my back row, I got a standing ovation from both sides of the aisle for the, uh, the work I had put into it. And uh, so that was my very first session uh, in the legislature. And then was my, that early in that uh, session? Oh, I don't recall when it was, but... Uh, <laughs> you remember it well. Well, one of the other things uh, is I commuted uh, every day to Leavenworth because I had family, went into my law office at night, would dictate and leave stuff for my secretary. And um, Fridays I'd go back and I had uh, law partners, but uh, you know I had to stay somewhat involved with clients. So uh, uh, I, I, as I recall, I stayed with somebody, Jim Slattery or somebody, uh, overnight uh, in order to stay and do the research. But um, so that was kind of the highlight of my first, uh, uh, very first session in the legislature. Then uh, in between my first and second session, still in the minority, uh, the minority leader was appointed by Governor Bennett to the Corporation Commission, and uh, the assistant minority leader was John Carlin. And uh, he was moved up to minority leader, which put him in the front row. And uh, he called me one day in, in between sessions and told me that uh, he, wanted, he was gonna move me to the desk right behind him and he wanted me to study between sessions four major issues. I don't recall all of them right now that uh, he knew were going to be issues that Governor Bennett was going to be seeking legislation on and that the Democrat Party would be opposing. And so I functioned as a result of that. And these issues did come up and were debated, uh, almost functioning like a floor leader in my second uh, term, uh, second session in the legislature. And so then um, in the next election, would have been the 76 election, um, I got a call about two o'clock in the morning uh, by one of the Democrat legislators telling me, believe it or not, we're in the majority. <laughs> And, uh, After the 76 election. Yes, and I said, I don't believe it, <laughs> put, put somebody else on the phone. And, uh, and so uh, it was confirmed that we went from, we had been 53, we went to 65. And uh, of course the majority is 63 in the House. And um, so again, by way of John Carlin, having become minority leader just for the one session, um, he, uh, he and I talked and he said he was going to run for speaker and pretty logically as minority leader suggested that I ought to consider running for majority leader and uh, I did and, and uh, was unopposed and was elected and so in 77 and 78 um, we worked very very closely together as speaker and majority leader. And um, also, uh, you might recall, it was 2119 Republican over Democrat in the Senate. And um, uh, Senator Garr pretty well controlled uh, 21 votes. Uh, Senator Steiniger would hold the 19, 
Democrats, and there were about five, including Senator Garr, from which um, they could draw the other two and uh, effectively send about any piece of legislation that we wanted down to Governor Bennett. And uh, big majority leader, uh, when he would call us down to tell us what he thought of legislation that was either coming or already on his desk, um, and I had, I had a great deal of admiration for Governor Bennett. I, I just, as two attorneys, uh, he didn't take anything personally, at least not to our faces. And, uh, uh, but then he would, uh, in the bills that we were talking about, I mean, it was a handful, but they weren't, you know, radical. And one of them was um, setting certain rates for income tax where it had been a flat rate for everybody, for example. Yeah. And uh, uh, he would write these scathing messages on those particular pieces of legislation uh, that would read just like a veto message and go on and on. And I loved his messages. I loved his state of the states because uh, he was so articulate and, and very bright. Uh, but then he would allow it to become law without a signature. <laughs> so I, he never did veto any of that particular set of bills that we sent down. I got through both houses and, and went down to his desk. So I, I, I think uh, that bill you're talking about allowed the highest income tax rates in the state's history. And it later got yeah, well that, reduced. But, I'll uh, tell you a funny story. I hope not to be digressing about that. Um, I had uh, later that year during the session, uh, being an Irishman, 100% Irish, um, we had a St. Patrick's Day dinner, uh, and I had uh, John Carlin, Jim Slattery, and Bill Reardon as guest speakers there. And uh, Slattery had carried the bill, <laughs> the, the tax bill. And uh, uh, he was explaining, and, and of course Jim's a smart politician, and he kept saying to the audience, we had a couple hundred people there, and, and he kept saying, and so you'd have to only be in the top 5% of taxpayers to have an increase. And there's a guy that I knew well in the audience who keeps waving his hand while Jim's speaking. And Jim leans over to me and says, do you know that guy? And I said, I know him very well. And he says, well, who is he? And I said, I said he's one of the 5%. <laughs> so uh, uh, anyway, we, it, was a, it was a very enjoyable period. And I actually was, re-elected to a third term uh, unopposed. I was unopposed after I won the first time. I was unopposed a second time in 76, and then I ran again when uh, John Carlin was running for governor. I ran for my house seat again before I resigned and was re-elected. And, um, and then again, he and I, I was very involved in his campaign, and. And um, in those days, they didn't provide uh, any space for an, uh, an elected governor before he was sworn in. So we had to run the transition from the speaker and the, and the uh, majority leader's offices. And I remember that was one of the first things he said he was gonna do as governor is provide funding for future governor elects to uh, be able to, to uh, obtain space, and I think now they even provide some in this building. But uh, um, so again, we worked through that transition together, and as a result of that, uh, we began talking about whether I would be interested in going into his administration, and ultimately I did as Secretary of Administration. I'm gonna come back to that. Based on what you described, John Carlin is assistant minority leader. He gets elevated right. to minority leader, then he becomes speaker. Right. Um, you and John Carlin must have 
hit it off real quickly. I mean, you're a freshman. He, I don't remember how long he's, he was there, but he'd been there. I think he'd been a couple of terms at yeah, least he'd before been there that. A while. Yeah, and I didn't know him at all previously. Um, I, you know, and I didn't know him well. Was my it first this defense of the? Uh, I, well, I think he observed that, you know, I would work hard and apparently could handle issues mm -hmm. and um, because as I said the I was still happy with freshmen in the far back of the chamber and uh, when uh, Pete Lux went to the KCC and John was going to move up uh, as minority leader um, that's when he contacted me and said that he was going to move me from my back seat to right directly behind uh, where the minority leader sits. Uh, that sounds like an assistant minority leader. Uh, Almost. One. Functioning that one way. Year. And that's, I think, what led to um, my running for majority leader and not having opposition because I had really functioned that second session on major issues virtually as a, an assistant minority leader or floor leader or what have you. And, uh, and actually, in those days, um, as anybody that was in the legislature and you were around the process, um, both sides of the aisle really got along well. Uh, I always used to describe the process in those days as one in which in the House they locked up 125 people for 90 days, made them deal with a whole lot of issues, arrive at compromise on those issues, and leave as friends. And uh, that that's really uh, how it, it worked in those days. So, uh, you know, I, I interacted with people on the other side of the aisle, no matter which, uh, whether I was in the minority or when I became the majority leader, um, still worked. Uh, Wendell Lady was the minority leader then. Wendell and I worked very well together, um, and uh, just any number of. Uh, you know, Mike Hayden was in the legislature then. We were friends then. We're friends to this day. Um, I I can't say whether that's different today than it was then, but uh, that's really how the process worked uh, then. <clears throat> let's focus a bit on uh, your second term. Uh, your majority mm -hmm. your colleagues have uh, elected you to uh, majority leader of the House. Um, what do you, how do you remember that? Those two years, those two uh, um, sessions. Well, uh, very fondly. Um, <laughs> more importantly, um, again, John Carlin being the speaker, uh, and as you know, our the majority leader in the speaker's offices are back behind the chamber. And um, so we interacted and discussed the agenda, discussed um, how we were going to get bills out of committee. I mean, we discussed virtually everything um, every day of the session and um, you know I think that led to that kind of a close working relationship um, Jim Slattery was a speaker pro tem uh, he was very actively involved with us in a lot of those discussions although his office was not behind the chamber where we could see each other anytime we wanted to or visit. We set the calendar jointly, uh, really did everything jointly and uh, uh, just came to understand each other, thought very much alike. Uh, I know when later when I became Secretary of Administration um, and was in the Capitol down the hall from the governor, um, I got to where I felt almost like I could finish his sentences um, <laughs> because we were, were so close and so compatible. Um, 
and it's just very you, enjoyable. You mentioned the tax issue. Other issues that come to mind in that? Uh, I'd have to give thought to... Um, death penalty? Oh, yes. I, I certainly remember. Um, and, of course, that comes over again. That, that, yeah, that had actually come up while we were in the legislature, both yeah. of us. We both voted against it, just on our personal okay. beliefs. And, um, but then when uh, John was running for governor, um, somewhere during his campaign, uh, where he was out around the state, he had indicated um, that he would be willing to support the death penalty if, if he were governor. And uh, I don't remember the words exactly, and I wasn't there when he said it. Uh, we certainly had discussions about it after he said it, um, only because I anticipated the box it would put him in. And not surprisingly, uh, as a result of that, um, I think he was governor eight years, two terms. I believe they put a death penalty bill on his desk every one of those eight years. And uh, an interesting little uh, sidebar to that is then he was succeeded, as you well know, by Governor Hayden. And uh, I don't think they put a death penalty bill on Governor Hayden's desk one of his four years. And obviously what that was a reflection of is they knew Governor Carlin would veto it, so you'd vote for it to put it on his desk. And um, some of the same people that were personally against it but voted for it for political reasons or whatever um, no longer voted for it when Mike Hayden was governor. Um, and to go back to the first time that happened, um, because of, of he really, uh, I'm talking about Governor Carlin now, really struggled intellectually when the bill, the first year the bill was put on his desk because of what he had said when he was campaigning, and yet he was personally against it. And um, one of the processes that uh, I established with his policy people was that um, I had two rules, because I met with them every day, because I was in the Capitol. Uh, my office was as secretary. And one, um, that I never wanted them to give him a policy recommendation that had any inaccuracies in it. And two, I never wanted him to talk about it publicly before he did logical rules, but um, rules that I was serious about. And um, so when the bill, uh, and, and to evaluate uh, bills as to uh, what the, not only what the effects were, but what the options were. And we, we literally established a process and went through it whereby there might be two or three options on a particular bill that led to whether to sign it or whether there was a problem with it. We had, I think, seven people that read every bill that was passed. I was the last one to read um, every bill. And we had a chart where you checked if it was okay to sign or if there was any question about it by any of the seven that read it. Um, they checked another column, and that meant you were going to discuss it with the governor. And um, if there were controversial bills like the death penalty, um, we would analyze options, and uh, I would present those to him in meetings. But the policy people would be there too. And on the de I'm telling you all this by way of the first year the death penalty uh, was put on his desk. Uh, we had a really um, lengthy discussion about uh, the particular bill. And as a lawyer, I'd analyzed it, and you could have made an argument that it could be vetoed because of the way it was written. 
or you could veto it because certain things were included or not included, or you could veto it for all time. And um, we must have debated that an hour or more and had several staff people in there. And uh, he, uh, John Carlin was a great one for listening. And uh, he just listened to all of the arguments and uh, uh, finally he said, I'm leaving for Cedar Crest for dinner, prepare uh, a veto message. To you? Uh, to all of us. To all of them. And I said, uh, which one? And he said, the absolute. Um, and so <clears throat> we did that and he vetoed it and uh, again, not surprisingly, Literally every year thereafter, a bill was put on his desk and he vetoed them all. Um, that was uh, probably one of the more intense Went issues. Went on for quite a while. Yes, it did. Um, another issue that comes to mind during the, your second term, your majority leader, um, is uh, corrections and building right. a new prison right. and oh, yes. corrections. Oh, yes. Uh, how do you remember that? Oh, I remember it vividly. <laughs> uh, we knew that uh, Governor Bennett uh, was intent on proposing building a new prison, but at the at least at the first part of that, if not through its entirety. Um, he had indicated he was going to build it in Osawatomie. Um, and um, I was aware that uh, Senior Senator Wentwinter represented Osawatomie. And uh, I guess there was some consideration of, of uh, eliminating the state hospital at Osawatomie and therefore build a prison there so that Went wouldn't lose you know, that, that many jobs. And um, so um, I was practicing law in Leavenworth. I was very familiar with the state prison. I'd been in it scores of times. And I was aware that uh, every cell house, there were four or five cell houses, and every one of them has five tiers. And the, literally the top two tiers of every cell house were vacant. So I was personally aware that it wasn't nearly at capacity. And so the long and short of all that is uh, Governor Carlin, or, or then uh, Speaker Carlin, appointed me to chair um, a corrections uh, interim committee. And we met for almost 200 hours over a period of uh, probably nine months, because we started right after the session and ran right up to November or December and introduced 14 pieces of legislation, one of which was community corrections, one of which allowed uh, uh, businesses to uh, be started outside of the prisons and employ inmates and uh, reorganize the parole board, a whole series of things, traveled to some other states to see what they were doing that was progressive, and recommended renovations at Lansing rather than than raising it. And uh, one of the things I remember, and the reason I say it was Oswatomi was always my understanding as to where he was going to recommend building it. In the uh, state of the state, uh, for the very first time, when he was delivering it here in this body, uh, and he mentioned the new prison, he said, and I'm recommending that we build the new prison in Leavenworth which was my district, <laughs> and uh, I, I do. And, uh, and if you recall Ambrose Dempsey, uh, when we were carrying, I was carrying all that legislation and um, I don't know, somebody raised the issue that, you know, well, Leavenworth is your district and actually the prison's in Lansing and, and Lansing was Ambrose's district, Ambrose Dempsey's. Uh, but I made the comment uh, from the floor that uh, I don't care if he recommends putting it in my backyard 
this was an objective, thorough process we went through and a unanimous decision not to build a new prison. Ambrose comes down to the mic. He's deceased, uh, bless his soul. And he says, it makes a difference to me because <laughs> it was going to be in, you know, in Lansing. Um, well, it didn't get built, and now they're talking about it again. So I have vivid recollection. And we had Dr. Carl Menninger, for example, as a conferee uh, who really was famous in that area. So. Well, let's, let's move on or actually go back a bit to earlier discussion. Um, you, in 78, run for re-election. Mm -hmm. uh, you're unopposed. Uh, right. You're elected. Uh, John Carlin's elected as well, right. elected as governor. Mm -hmm. um, you've kind of been a team uh, for that uh, term. And, and had been through his campaign. I was very actively involved in his campaign. Um, uh, surprise to many folks, maybe not to, uh, to you, but uh, um, you decided to leave the legislature right. to talk about how you well, made that decision. Um, because I was offered the opportunity to not only be Secretary of Administration, but to remain, it was clearly understood I, I would have the opportunity to remain fully involved in policy, um, as work as closely with a governor. I'd probably never have that opportunity again uh, in, in my life. And um, that was attractive to me and because we had spent four years working closely together. And um, so, um, you know, I discussed it with my family and, and so forth and considered it, you know, every way and with my law partners and, and what have you. And uh, anyway, decided to do it. And um, was, did you decide almost immediately or did, was no, that kind of I, hanging I, for a while? Well, again, um, I, I, I gave consideration to making a final decision. I mean, you could but have been minority leader. Uh, that, or, or, or speaker, regained. had we remained in the, <laughs> yeah, in the, in the majority. Yeah. Uh, that would have been an interesting decision that I would have had if to make. You, if yes. the House had not flipped. Yes, exactly. right. Because we did flip right back to the, to the minority again right. in that election. Um, that, that really didn't have a bearing on my leaving the legislature. It was the opportunity to work um, on policy and yeah, work close. The, the governor elect say, Pat, I want you to join me. I mean, well, ultimately, no, not not like day one, but again, uh, I had been so involved in the campaign, I mean, with him an awful lot, um, certainly in meetings where you're discussing how to campaign, what issues and all that. And then during the transition, which begins in November until you're sworn in in January, again, we were working in this chamber because those we were not given any any additionals fortunately we had and these the offices governor probably wasn't cooperating um, he was actually <laughs> I'm not going to use names again but uh, he actually was very cooperative um, indicated that uh, one of the things for example uh, we knew there were a couple of thousand or more uh, appointments that a a governor makes to boards and things. And uh, he offered to uh, make any information available to us um, that we would need to deal with. Um, turned out that was never delivered to us. Uh, not, <laughs> offered, but not delivered. Not, well, I don't think he was aware that it wasn't. 
Uh, I know why it wasn't, but I'm not going to <laughs> go into that. Uh, some of his staff was more distressed at the, his defeat than he personally was. So you're uh, almost immediately after the We're working together. Working on that's, this transition. That's correct, yeah. Mm -hmm. When did, I mean, did the position secretary of administration immediately emerge well, in your mind? Well, um, he, uh, he, he either asked or we talked about um, performing some uh, work almost full time um, during the transition, which was in retrospect almost like a prelude to coming into the administration. So it was kind of a natural evolution and uh, I can't honestly recall at what point um, he talked about Secretary of Administration. At, at what time did you vacate the seat? Um, the, and David may recall this, uh, I, I think I actually, um, it wasn't right, it was before the session started, but it was either like if we were having some meetings before the session, um, I made it clear that I was going to resign and then they had to appoint uh, a, a successor. Uh, the Central Committee did of Lovemorth and did. And um, so I didn't, I didn't serve any yeah. days of the following session. Now, I've actually run on to two different dates uh, as to how long you served as secretary. One is 82 and one is 83. 83, about November of 83. So that was a year into the second uh, term. Uh, Carlin's second term. That's correct. Uh, what I had told um, the governor, again, because I had six kids by then, and um, I just in a friendly conversation said, you know, my oldest will be ready for college if I stay eight years. And uh, I had told him that even before he was reelected. I mean, in that last year of the four year term. And, uh, you know, that I'm, I won't be able to stay another four years. And so he knew that. And, um, you know, you get into a session and the session runs on and then you get into other things. So it took me most of another year to, uh, to actually transition out. And I, ironically, if you remember Bill Hoke, the press secretary, um, Bill and I left in the same month, but unrelated to our personal decisions as to why we were leaving. Um, but that was, that was why I did. Really, that was the primary reason. I, I essentially said I need to get back into law or something to make money to send my kids. My kids are close enough together that six of them were in grade school one year and all in private schools, so. Um, let's focus on your time, your time with Governor Carlin in the administration. Um, Carlin, in an interview not that long ago, a few years ago, said 80% of what uh, I got done was done in my second term. Um, obviously, you were around the first term. Mm -hmm. um, how do you remember that first term? I mean, you were intimately involved right. in the governor's, and we talked about the death penalty. Mm -hmm. well, I, well, I was, and I mean, again, um, one of the really fortunate things in my life as I, uh, from politics, as I look back on it, was because I was in the same building, because he didn't have a chief of staff by name, um, 
I was almost functioning that way as well. I'd have days where most of my day was in the governor's office. And almost every meeting he would have with anybody, association heads or whatever, um, I would attend as well as then meeting. I met every day with his policy staff at the end of the day, about four o'clock. I'd go down and say, where are we on this issue or that issue? And, and uh, you know, are you ready? No, we're not ready and whatever. Um, the, the other thing I focused on in my first, uh, in the first four years, solely from the perspective of Secretary of Administration was, and I believe Governor Bennett saw this same thing and began down this same road. Um, and that was that prior to Governor Bennett becoming governor, it was my impression that uh, government, state government was almost totally decentralized. Every major department was like, like their own fiefdom. And um, I spent an awful lot of my time as secretary and I had some really, really good staff people. Uh, one of the things that I inherited or was able to was that uh, Bob Steffen was elected attorney general at that same time. Kurt Schneider as attorney general had what I considered maybe the best staff of lawyers that I've ever seen an attorney general assemble. Um, and so I, and John Martin was one of them who any lawyer would know wrote every opinion for years and was relied on, you know, to take calls and all that. Well, I hired John as my general counsel, hired Chuck Briscoe as off of Schneider's staff as another one of my attorneys, Roger Walters as another one of them, all three off of that staff. And, um, then John left after about a year and a half, and so I hired Art Griggs, who was one of the senior revisors. And uh, the person that was like number three in the budget division, a fellow named Gary Howland, uh, I moved up to my office and made a deputy secretary. And um, the reason for all of that was that uh, I wanted to centralize everything in state government through the Department of Administration, where I used to say in speeches, you want, and we did. And, and one of the impetuses to that was that Governor Bennett had created um, a committee headed by um, um, the head of Martin Tractor and- uh, Bill Martin. Yeah, Bill Martin, and I think the head, then head of uh, Southwestern Bell. Yeah. And they had finished their product and had like 125 recommendations. I met with them three or four times, was very impressed with their recommendations, saw that it would take me in the direction that I wanted to go to gain control, almost like a business over... Um, you know, why should every department have its own IT department? Why should their personnel be independent of uh, the personnel division in the... That was a loaned executive task force that Ben well, created. Um, we implemented all of it and more even as we built on it through the, those first four years. and. Um, as a result, when uh, Governor Carlin was first announcing he was running for re-election, um, we were being attacked. I was called before a couple of legislative committees on, you know, well, you all haven't done anything. And I produced that study and had it scored by Gary Howland, who was both a lawyer and a fiscal expert. And so we had a whole volume of, well, so one press conference laying all that out, that issue never rose again. <laughs> uh, but truly, we centralized everything to where I used to say, not arrogantly, but factually, 
you can no longer hire, fire, lease, do anything without it having to go through the Department of Administration. Over the many, many years since then, in my opinion, unfortunately, that has reverted back to where most departments are operating almost. The, the biggest obstacle uh, that I initially got or objection was from a person that later we all knew well and became a very, very, very close friend of mine over the years, and that was Bob Harder, who had been in SRS from day one, back Bob Docking's days through Governor Bennett, et cetera. And, you know, he pretty much ran SRS uh, with an iron fist, and I'd get all kinds of objections. Why do you insist on this, that? Well, over time, Bob came around to the point of where he said, you know, I, I like this because everybody's operating by the same rules now. And as long as it keeps going that way, you know, it'll, it'll work fine. And so, uh, so that's what I was, in addition to all this other stuff, as secretary, I was really focused on that. And, and we had it by the end of the four years and we're able to demonstrate it and illustrate it by a lot of facts. And I mean, we had called into a Senate committee one time, laid it all out and it was like, no questions. So anyway, I don't, uh, that's a long digression. I stayed close to the governor through his second four years. Um, I mean, we still discuss things all the time, policy things, and um, uh, I would agree that his accomplishments, his last, his fourth year, he had seven constitutional amendments. I mean, I was still, you know, visiting with him regularly, and if not daily, and uh, one of the things I remember about those seven constitutional amendments was, uh, was after they were all going to be put on uh, on the ballot, I guess. I think they'd already passed, but anyway, um, Art Griggs or somebody came along and said, uh, no, there's a statute that says you can't put more than four on in the general or the primary, so we had to have a discussion about well, which ones have a better chance of passing in a primary where less people vote. Etc. So, but he he passed seven constitutional amendments yeah. in his fourth year, and did a lot of other things too. Um, a couple issues related to um, to that. Um, I know one of the campaign issues in '78 was utility issues, and uh, that so, seemed to happen. I mean, once the election was over, I think that got done the first session early on, uh, removing that sales tax. It, of course, still bounces around. Mm -hmm. uh, were you involved in... Oh, yes. <laughs> did you... Yes. In fact, we had people, close friends of his, some legislators saying, you don't need to do that right away. And I was adamant that, yes, you do. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're gonna do it, do it immediately because right or wrong, there was a lot of identification with that issue in the campaign. I don't personally think that's what caused his victory, but. As Secretary of Administration, de facto Chief of Staff, did you have a lot of direct work with the legislature, or were you more? Uh... Yes. Um, one of the things, of course, we both had just come out of the legislature, and so we knew everybody in the House and the Senate. And again, it was a different time where you had been used to, as legislators, working things out with the other side of the aisle, whichever side you were on, and um, and then getting a pat, you compromised. And so um, 
one of the things that uh, we did is meet during sessions with um, legislative leadership separately, not both parties at the same time, um, and would discuss the major things that he was trying to accomplish legislatively and reach consensus and allow flexibility and you know so that they could amend it within reason and we'd, we'd reach an understanding to that effect and uh, I remember those discussions would usually end okay we're in agreement now you guys have got to go get the votes and uh, but we do it separately with the, the two parties uh, we just figured we weren't going to accomplish much if we had them all there together. So and that worked very well. I, again, you know, we knew them so well. We had worked with them. Um, I think there was value in the fact that there was a different majority in each house in 77 and 78. So we, um, you know, we even then had to do compromising on things. Uh, so that each house could feel like they had their imprint on Was there rate. ever a time over that five years with the Carlin administration that you and the youth were adamant and telling the governor, you're wrong on this, this is a bad decision? Um, I don't recall nothing comes to mind in terms of policy, um, but particularly uh, because of this process that I described that, that we established, um, whereby I, I would always sort of drive his policy people towards um, come up with two or three options on whatever the issue was you know, do this much or this much or this much, whatever it happened to be. And uh, we would not recommend uh, to him then, um, you know, we think the second one is the best. Because if you did that that way and you did it objectively, the way it would work out almost every time was by saying, well, here's an option, here's an option, and here's an option. One of those options was pretty clearly, intellectually, the best option, and uh, politically and otherwise. And so that's how most of those things would be presented to him. And uh, you wouldn't have to say, you know, go with the second one. He'd, he'd say, well, I, it looks to me like the second one or the third one or whatever is the best. Both can we get it done practically or politically through the legislature, but is a good policy. Um, the other thing I was always emphasizing to his policy people is you have to look ahead at the a year or more, long, long range. I, I was insistent on that, that something that looks good today resolves a, an issue for today may not, not just fiscally, but from whatever perspective, may not work as well or look as good three or four or five years down the road. So you always want to look at it that way. And that was always built into the presentations on the options. And it was really an interesting process in that he would make a decision then as to uh, we'll go this way with whatever it was. Um. I don't know if that would work today or not, but uh, that, that's how we... <laughs> One of, uh, Bob Beatty did the interview of John Carlin, a fairly extensive mm -hmm. interview, mm -hmm. and uh, there was a great dis bit of discussion of internal Democrat Party politics oh, yes. and the docking mm -hmm. uh, yeah. folks and the Carlin folks and uh, Did you help kind of sort through all of that? I mean, I, I was certainly involved in it uh, and aware of it. 
Appointments, um, for example, mm -hmm. um, judicial yeah. appointments. Uh, Any kind of appointments, frankly. Um, I, I will give Governor Bennett credit again in that um, I don't mean to, to say this uh, in a negative way about uh, Governor Dockings or, or his predecessor's days, but there was a lot more patronage. Um, I knew people even in Leavenworth when I was practicing law that were supposed to be full-time this, that, or the other, and they were back doing their jobs. And I'd see them you know, daily and say, I thought you were <laughs> head of this, that, or the other. And that's the way things were then. And, I, and again, my perception was Governor Bennett was determined to change that and started down that road. And uh, we... Uh, um, we were not the favorites uh, as a result. Uh, we, Carlin and yeah, yeah, right, of, um, of that system. And I'm not going to name names, but, you know, there was a person that was in, uh, responsible for patronage in southeast Kansas. There was one in the Wichita area. Uh, there was one in... Topeka, there was one in Wyandotte County, um, and uh, they expected to be able to name um, people that we would appoint to pretty important positions, and um, and that you know that was a kind of a continuing confrontation as a result. Um, uh, John Carlin wanted the best people. I mean, it sounds easy to say, but in fact, um, as again, my observation was Governor Bennett did, um, that he could put into important positions and uh, that they were expected to do it full time. Um, <clears throat> I had a, be careful what I say here. Um, Within uh, the first month or so of being secretary, I had a person that had been held a, a pretty important position in the docking administration come in to see me and said, um, you know, would you tell Governor Carlin I'd like to uh, be the head of either this agency or this agency, but two conditions. One... I'm not going to move from, and he was from somewhere out in western Kansas. And the second condition was, I want to continue to spend my winters in Mexico because I own a home there. And that's how he had functioned. And I said, well, I think the governor intends for these to be full-time positions. And didn't offend him. Said, well, then I'm not interested. <laughs> and we had a you know, a few issues where we would learn that people that were, um, you know, on this board or that, important boards that were supposed to function full time um, were still either practicing law back home or one thing or another, and we'd have to deal with those. And so, you know, again, quite frankly, my, and I think John had the same view of things, is that um, government was a much more complicated and uh, business-like activity. And again, I've always given credit to uh, Governor Bennett for recognizing that and, and uh, being absolutely intent on seeing that things were run that way. And uh, in my mind, at least, and I think John shared it, we wanted to continue and establish and lock that in um, because, you know, as you well know from your own experience, it's, it is very, very complicated and there's an awful lot of money involved and there are an awful lot of responsibilities um, to the citizens through a variety of programs. and. Um, I don't know that we're right on point on some of those things yeah. anymore.
Um, well, let's shift uh, gears uh, again. Uh, you talked earlier about uh, your decision to leave the Carlin administration mm -hmm. and a little bit about the considerations involved. Um, and I can track your career pretty much when it's in the public sector, but uh, uh, not as much, obviously, uh, when you're in the private sector. Uh, but it looked to me like from 83 through 2011, mm -hmm. you were in the private sector right. representing clients. That's correct. And uh, as you look back at that, uh, how, did, how would you explain it? What were you doing <laughs> for well, that? 30, I mean, that's 30 years. That's correct, exactly, yeah. Um, uh, how would you characterize that time? Well, actually, I did not, that was not what I thought I was going to end up doing when I left. Um, I thought I was either, I mean, I knew I was going to leave, and, and the governor knew that. Um, I thought I would either go back into law practice whether back in Leavenworth or here or Kansas City or somewhere. I have a brother that's a lawyer in Kansas City. and, and um, But almost immediately, um, I mean, maybe within weeks, I was contracted by, uh, contacted by a prospective client um, that was bidding on a state contract. And um, would I have an interest in representing them? And that's kind of um, how I ended up in. I, I had a, also had a couple of opportunities to go into the corporate sector, which in an administrative capacity. And I was very interested in that opportunity, but it was going to be delayed a few months for internal reasons in the in the corporations that were approaching me. And so almost by default, I was already doing these other things by the time those opportunities were open. And, uh, and it just, I, I, because I'd, I'd been so deeply involved in policy, I was interested in um, more statewide issues. And uh, the first big statewide issue that I, did was multi-bank holding company legislation. And uh, I was approached by uh, Jordan Haynes and Tom Clevenger and people like that, whom I knew from the, my time on the pool money board. And anyway, I, I passed that legislation, worked with Gary Shear on it, because he was at Fourth National then, and the infamous Jordan Haynes, who got things done. Um, and it kind of just evolved from there. And then um, the next big thing I was in was uh, um, Governor Hayden had become governor. And, and you'll recall, he uh, one of his top priorities was a transportation program. And uh, um, he didn't get it through the first session. Then he had a special session and didn't get it through. And um, I. I had talked to Jordan and some people in Wichita and said, I think if you put it together strategically the right way, you can get one passed. And visited with uh, the governor and some of his people, um, particularly at KDOT. Um, I think Horace Edwards was at KDOT then. And, and um, so I got hired to do that, and we passed that 10 year program. Yeah. Burdett Loomis uh, wrote a book about that, yeah. interviewed you extensively. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, <clears throat> at the time, or in the book, it describes you as a principal of McGill and Company. That was, that, in the, that was in the second one. That? Uh, no, wait a minute. No, that, that was the first one. Yeah. Um, 
I had, of course, I'd known Pete from my days in the legislature, and uh, we had talked, because uh, I was a sole proprietor when I was on yeah, my Yeah, I was own. wondering, yeah, were you yeah. a, a... Solely by myself. A, and For the whole 30? No, no, no. Uh, for... Early on. Yeah, when I first started into it. And uh, Pete and I had talked off and on about working together on things, but uh, for the first year or two or whatever, we always had conflicts, it seemed like. We were on the opposite side. Well, he was on the opposite side of the multi-bank holding yeah. company. Um, and um, so, I don't know, whatever year it was, it was when Governor Hayden was in office, we talked w one point and didn't have conflicts, and so um, I joined with him for about five years, and it was during that period that um, uh, the 89 a program was passed, and, and I visited with the governor, and he said, you know, fine, I've tried twice, and if you've got a strategy to get it through, um, and, and I developed a strategy, um, which was two half-cent sales taxes plus motor fuels and registration, and half, one half-cent was going to go to uh, education, and one half-cent part of the funding for the transportation program. And the irony is that uh, we got it out of the Senate. Um, I arranged with Senate leadership to run it in the right order to where people that were for the half cent for education but didn't care about transportation were going to have to vote for transportation first, etc. So anyway, um, then it got over here, and um, um, unbelievably, uh, the education supporters couldn't get together um, the votes to support their half cent sales tax. And we carried, and Jim Braden was a speaker then, and, and I'd served with Jim. He and I'd come in the same year, so we were good friends, and he kept calling me or visiting and saying, you know, I can only carry it over so long. I mean, the bills were over here. And uh, uh, I remember then that finally the lobbyist for uh, KNEA I went to and said, uh, you know, do you have your votes put together? Because I can get the votes from the other side. And uh, if not, I'm going to have to cut your, your half cent and just let it go. And he finally came back and said, no, I can't, I can't produce the votes. They wanted more. And, uh, and you're talking about uh, Democrats supporting it. Well, basically. the organization that they support was the one that had to give them the word. And uh, um, they were holding out for more, the association was. So anyway, that's how it got passed. And then I did it again in 99 when Governor Graves was, I was, I, I was hired by e Economic Lifelines and, and I built that into about a 50 board, 50 member board organization. And uh, the second one, um, the strategy was, we're gonna take this statewide and uh, hold a dozen hearings across the state. Mary Turkington was the head of it. And, um, uh, you know, two hour meetings or more and bring in every community and every chamber and et cetera, saying what their transportation needs were. And we were very careful always to say, um, there's no guarantees, but if, if the program is big enough, and of course the point was get your legislators to support as big a program as possible, if it's big enough, you'll have a good shot at uh, what you say your local needs are. And uh, it was pretty amazing. I mean, we were having two and three hundred or more people at each one of these meetings. And boy, I mean, they were city after city, county after county, being allowed to testify before, I don't remember, a 20 or so person uh, committee of uh, lay people. 
And um, so that's how the second one got passed. And um, then I was still with Economic Lifelines. When the third one in 2010 got passed, T works, but then, you know, as you know, that's, I mean, when you take $3 billion out of the highway fund, um, you yeah. can't. Um. And anyway, my point of that was I did a lot of, I liked statewide issues. I was involved with, when Bob Harder was no longer secretary, he and I did mental health reform one time. I did the cigarette tax increase with Governor Graves. Um, did some statewide things with Governor Finney. Uh, I just liked those big issues as opposed to get this little bill passed for. Probably of all the things you were involved in, the highway transportation issue is probably the most significant. Yeah, I mean it was a and few it went billion. On for quite a while. Right, it was a few billion dollars each of the ten-year programs. Yeah, yeah. Um, billion, um, and and bonding. And I don't recall your being high profile as much in other issues, but maybe I'm just um, missing it. I I don't like to be high profile. Um, I know the process. You used to know virtually all the players and would work predominantly with leadership um, because I knew them, had, had worked with them on a variety of issues. And I think it's the lawyer training again, and I had tried a lot of cases uh, when I was practicing and understand you, you're going to be successful if you've got a strategy that'll work. So I always looked at the strategy of how do you pass this. When I did the cigarette tax, we had the largest cigarette tax increase in the United States that one year. And uh, I got the American Associations of Heart, Cancer, Lung, Robert Wood Johnson, a variety of those uh, together to where um, they had such a network constituents that, uh, I mean, I, th I think what I understood from my time dealing with the legislature better than anything was that if you can apply pressure from their own constituents, um, that's where you have the greatest chance for success. Now, you started out as sole practitioner. Did you add staff then or were um, you always? Well, I, I, uh, I joined Pete uh, somewhere during uh, my cadence years, uh, maybe early on, I don't remember. I stayed with Pete for about five years um, into the early part of the Finney years. Were you an employee then? Or? I, technically I was, so but you... um, our arrangement was I was responsible for two things essentially because he had he had several young people working for him one identify the issues that were coming down the pike that we may you know be interested in working and two then develop the strategy for how to do it um, and it just kept getting bigger and bigger and uh, um, I, I just didn't want to stay, and I think one year we had 11 registered lobbyists. You had, I didn't catch it. I think we had 11 registered lobbyists, counting Pete and myself and nine yeah. others. And so I, I just, it was a you know, friendly mutual agreement that I said, I'm just gonna go back on my own. Okay. And that would have still been, oh, maybe, 91, 92, yeah. something like that. And uh, from then on, um, I, I would more work with other lobbyists as opposed to hiring, you know, uh, staff. I've, I've probably worked projects with about every 
lobbyist that's been around here a long time, John Peterson. I did a variety so of things together. So you contract with others? Um, well, or, or we'd reach an agreement on a particular client that we both work at and how we divide the comp. The other thing that I got more and more into from my experience as Secretary of Administration was contract procurement work. Um, where I would represent large companies, nationwide or worldwide companies, that bid on uh, service contracts, uh, whether they were computer services. Like I represented Accenture for 25 years, probably, um, and companies like that, uh, where every time there'd be a contract that would come up that they were interested in bidding on. Um, I would be retained or continue, most of them would continue to retain me just to watch for contracts that they might be interested in. And I would say the last 10 years before I went back to Leavenworth as county administrator, um, I prob 80, probably 80% 80 of what I did was, uh, I was also being referred, there's a company in Washington, D.C. that um, really was like a clearinghouse. Uh, they would have companies come to them that were the kind of companies that bid on statewide contracts all over the United States. And they looked for someone in every state hmm. that they could contract with. And because of my years of experience, I worked with them for years and they would send it said, do you have any interest in representing this company that's going to bid on, you know, such and such? I, I represented uh, GTAC on the lottery contract for 26, 27 years, probably. And uh, as a sole practitioner. Basically. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. uh, and there the value was that I was a lawyer and, and then simultaneously knew the purchasing process and... The, um, and most of that, you didn't really have to get directly involved in the legislature. I mean, I, I would be involved every session with one thing or another, or, but I, I didn't like to take a whole lot of little stuff. Um, I was always more interested, if not on the contract stuff, um, on big statewide issues, if I could get in, you know into them. Not that different from working for a governor and strategizing. That's right. Yeah, really. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I, I just believe you should have a strategy for everything to be successful, and that's why you. I was never offended, and wouldn't to this day be offended, if I went to a legislator and said, uh, you know, what what is your position on this particular issue? Um, you know, if they said, uh, well, one, you better learn in a hurry if you're in this business. If they say I'm undecided, don't, don't count them as anything other than that. Don't think they're a yes until they tell you they are. Um, but, you know, the other thing is that I, I would rather have an unequivocal no so that I know, good, okay, I, I don't have to work on that legislator. And when I say work, again, I try to work from the grassroots up on anything that I can. You know, it's, I'm not going to persuade them as much as their constituents are. Now, my impression early on, say, um, uh, with Jordan Haynes or um, uh, McGill, that you would Obviously, McGill would work one side and you'd work the other side. Is that accurate? Or well, um, we're, our approaches were probably different in the sense that Pete was much more the politician. Um, and so he, whether he'd call in favors or whatever, however he would do it, uh, because he went back so far with him. Um, my approach was much more, while I knew them, I wouldn't 
I don't know that I've ever would you, you owe vote. me this. Yeah, well, I'd never say that. Yeah. But I don't know that I'd even say would you uh, support this. It, do this as a it'd favorite. be a reason. You know, here's why this is good. This is good for your constituents because whatever. So, kind of. Uh, I I don't. It. Was I mean, you, we got along fine, Pete and I, but our styles were certainly different. It sounds, just based on what you've said, if you had a niche, sounds like legislative strategy. Really? And state uh, strategy. Yes, I, I, absolutely, I, I would agree with that. That I just, uh, and I keep saying, you know, it's, it's the lawyer training, but, you know, that's how you try cases. I mean, um, and, and my experience here is that's, that's what passes stuff. You better figure out, you know, when you've done it so long, I could sit in a committee. Uh, one, I would already know, you know, the general inclination of every member of that committee on, a, on any particular issue. I mean, not just ideologically, but even down on the merits of the issue. And, uh, you know, I used to leave committees a lot, or I wouldn't be there. Or the common joke used to be something big must be going on today because Hurley's in the Capitol. Uh, but I didn't need to, because of the way I approach things. Um, I, I just had a good sense of, if I put it together strategically the right way and have know that I've got support uh, locally or organizationally or association-wise or whatever, whatever your resources are, that um, uh, that's how it was going to get passed. Um, did you turn away business? Y yes. I would never represent a tobacco company, for example even before I pass the increase. Um, my wife's a nurse, I'm absolutely convinced. That my mother and my sister had cancer. Um, I'm, I just wouldn't. Um, religious reasons, I'm a Catholic, I wouldn't take certain issues. Um, growing up, I had seven priests that were relatives. Uh, <laughs> Or, so I was always looking over my shoulder, but yeah, they're, they're, I, I'd never promote anything on the death penalty side, for example. I, um, I'm going to shift gears again. Um, are we still on? <laughs> <laughs> is the tape still running? I yeah, think it is. Yeah. Um, you get to 2011, and you shift gears, mm -hmm. and um, you know I did go back and look, and you were still representing a number of organizations. Yeah, yeah. 2010, right. 11. Yes. Um, you had all, I mean, 30 years of experience, right. success. Right. Um, what was going on? A couple of things. Um, one of the things I've learned in this business, um, and it's pure politics, is, um, and probably I benefited from it like others have, uh, when I left uh, Governor Carlin and he was still governor for three years. Um, you know, what particularly companies uh, or industries or whatever uh, outside of the state itself, and maybe within the state, um, that are sophisticated about how politics works is kind of the, the crassest question that they ask themselves is, who's closest to this administration? And um, probably there, as I said, I'm sure probably I benefited um, the three years that John Carlin was still governor um, because you know, be common knowledge that well, Hurley is as close to him as anybody. Um, I didn't ever ask him to do anything, uh, 
but I also, because we remained so close, I knew what issues he was interested in and so forth. Um, and so with the change of administrations from the 2010 election, um, I began having uh, some clients that uh, I had had for years say to me that uh, we think we need to get representation from the administration that's going into office. That did not occur um, to any great adverse effect when uh, Governor, Governor Hayden came into office or Governor Graves came into office. Um, but anyway, I started getting some of that. But then the other thing that simultaneously occurred um, was um, that I was approached by whether I would that ha you were have it, I was approached uh, actually by um, oh, you I'm you would know Clyde Graber and yeah. and he had been a legislator and a variety of things and he was on the county commission in Leavenworth and called me literally and said we're looking to hire a county administrator would you have any interest? And of course, my roots being there and all. And um, anyway, long and short of it, I had a couple of meetings back there and thought, well, yeah, you know, I'll, I'll do that. So I did it for five, so I left here for five years. And uh, I worked out arrangements for the first two or three years with uh, different people um, that uh, with clients that I'd had for some time uh, to do cost sharing and that I would assist them and I, and I was allowed under my contract with Leavenworth County um, to do other stuff as long as it didn't interfere with not be over here constantly but particularly contract type work um, even though I may have reached an agreement with somebody to share with me Company X, if they needed assistance in the future on bidding on something, I was allowed to do that, um, okay. and and I did some of that, and um, and I've I've gotten back no, into that since I didn't been, sign up as a lobbyist at all. I always did. did. Every um, even though they weren't directly in the now they're talking about requiring it. Yeah. Uh, but I always registered for uh, every uh, contract procurement company that I represented. Uh, I just didn't ever want to be questioned about it. Um, so, and the stuff that I did um, when I was still in Leavenworth, uh, I had two or three times where, well, one of them was a company that I had represented twice previously over the years, and um, they had gone to someone else, and in the course of discussions with that person and them, they realized, well, yeah, Pat Hurley's still around, still alive, whatever. So I went to a couple of meetings with them only to discuss, you know, how are you going to bid it and so forth. What I used to do is go through the procurement process. I mean, I would go with the company right to the table. I'd often ask questions of the state representative, I don't mean legislative representatives, but agency folks. Um, you know, it's, a, it's just a dialogue. It's a competitive bid process. In fact, we wrote that law uh, when I was secretary because uh, the low dollar bid, you know, statute wasn't working on a complex um, bid for a software system or something. Um, I learned that very quickly when I had somebody with three employees in a little tiny company tell me they were going to bid and they were going to lowball it on some big multi million dollar contract, and that if uh, they didn't get it. They were going to hold a press conference in the rotunda, and I said, "Go ahead and hold your press conference, but you've got to be qualified." 
And you had to write these incredibly long RFPs as a result. And so we passed the procurement statutes, which is a different set of statutes from the low dollar bid one. And uh, it's worked really, really well in that you write a pretty generic RFP and then all the dialogue goes on between the state and one or more bidders. Yeah. So I, I, I just got more and more into that. Back on Leavenworth County, um, as you look back at your five years there, how would you characterize that line of work? Well, uh, I, I enjoyed it, um, probably more because I was from there and still knew, you know, so many people and almost everybody that was in local government I knew, um, even if they were another generation after mine, I knew them, the families. Um, at the end of five years, I told them I didn't want to renew a contract. I was on annual contracts. And the primary reason was that um, local government is uh, different enough that uh, it's, it can be frustrating and that uh, commissioners get calls. Uh, they want something done that's not on the agenda or out of the order of, I tried to establish a whole lot of processes again you know, here's, here's how we ought to be doing road work. Here's how we ought to be doing this, that, and the other. Great idea, adopt, you know, this is how we'll do it. And then I don't know how many times a commissioner would come I in and say. I was wondering if your ideas on centralizing yeah, administration. Yeah, very worked. much. Well, we establish the rules, but then what happens, and, I, you know, I understand local politics and that, but I don't know how many times a commissioner would say, well, I know it doesn't meet the criteria, but, you know, I got a call from a guy I've known forever, and, you know, they, if they had to get everybody to sign up on this particular road for us to do it, they, they're short, too, and can't we do it? And I said, well, then where does it stop, then? And, and, and I had to be so careful because the press was at every meeting and, and I was very conscious of not wanting to embarrass a commissioner, you know, with a headline that said they wanted us to go violate our own policies. So, and then it, it got very political uh, for a variety of reasons among the commissioners and I, and I thought, saw it was going to get worse. And, I just said I don't want to do it anymore. Well, kind of a wrap up. Um, you've been able to watch mostly state politics, state government for four, we're going back 40, That's right. yeah. 45 years. Uh, obviously, a lot of changes in that time frame. Um, how do you assess all this? Is it, I mean, you've been able to work uh, through it probably as well as anybody. Uh, uh, obviously left it for a while here yeah. recently. But, uh, the biggest change that I say I would, ob would observe over all those years and decades is um, and it, it's true in Congress, it's true here, probably in most states, is there are such deep ideological divisions now that drive the voting patterns on major policy. And, um, and there's just absolutely no give and take, no compromise. It, it has improved a little, it appears here, um, by the change in the makeup of, and as I think I said in the beginning, uh, or maybe at lunch, um, you used to work across the aisle easily um, and no hard feelings at all. No, nobody held grudges. Some of the people I respected most uh, that I came to know were on the other side of the aisle. 
but you could talk to them about anything. And uh, they were reasonable, well-educated, and well-intentioned. And um, that changed for a while here in, um, in some, uh, what I view as bad policy was made, significantly bad policy. And um, then it kind of began to change back again. You know the issues I'm talking about. Um, but I, I see it even worse at the congressional level. Um, and of course the big difference there is they aren't bound to balance the budget. And it's just unbelievable to me that well, they just keep spending and spending. Um, I have my <clears throat> my own strong views on the uh, tax policy changes, and I anticipated uh, what was going to result from those, and it did, and it's uh, going to take a long time. And then we've got the courts. Um, that's a that's a split that doesn't work well, in my opinion, and that, um, you know, the courts aren't, it isn't their responsibility, I don't mean legally, just by the nature of their job to make fiscal decisions and decide how you fund things. And if you look at only through the prism of, um, well, everything's got to meet these two standards regardless of cost, is there ever an end to that? And, um, and then the legislature, you know, it's up in arms about it and... Uh, I, uh, I'd be interested in com any comments you might make on it, uh, and you may not want to. Uh, 94. Democrats lost 14 seats in the House. Uh, they lost. And that's the, after they had been in the majority? Um, actually, that's two years after that. Okay. Uh, that was when um, uh, Grace was elected, but mm -hmm. uh, uh, I think uh, Bob Miller was uh, out put out of a uh, speaker's job. Uh, Democrats lost two congressional seats and didn't lose, lost one, and, mm -hmm. and Jim mm -hmm. Slattery vacated the seat yeah. to run for yeah. governor, so yeah. lost those seats. And then in 2010, uh, Democrats lost 14 more seats. Uh, to the point where the Republican majority in the House is 92 mm -hmm. three. Yeah. Um, well, we could go a long time more. <laughs> uh, what, what, I uh, have some very are, are, strong are, I mean, views on The early years we're talking about, you mentioned 2119 in mm -hmm. the Senate. Mm -hmm. uh, the House flips twice in about a 15-year period. Um, it was competitive time. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think there were interpretives for it. Well, I think it, it was always my opinion, right or wrong, and certainly, you know, no proof of it. But when we took the majority in. Uh, 77 and 78, the Democrats in the House, I thought that was um, more a reflection of post-Watergate than anything, hmm. uh, right or wrong, uh, mm -hmm. because that happened around the country. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then particularly because it flipped back to, I think, the exact numbers. I think we went from 53 to 65, and then I think back to 53. <laughs> two years later. Now, I know that some of our incumbents didn't work as hard as they should have and all that, but still, um, this is a 
very, very Republican state and uh, always has been. And um, amazingly, we have elected a lot of Democrats as governor, but um, uh, you, it's a, it's a difficult state for a Democrat to run in, period. I, I know Jim Slattery and I are very, very close friends, and uh, I remember Jim always saying that when we lost the 5th Congressional District, and he picked up uh, all the way down to the Oklahoma border and over the Missouri border, how much more difficult that district became um, because you just there, you know, there have been pockets of of uh, the state that were heavily, uh, you know, it used to be uh, Sedgwick County. If you're running as a Democrat for governor, you counted on carrying Sedgwick County because of, of the heavy concentration of labor down there more than anything else. Um, that's changed significantly. The the whole ideology of the county has shifted seemingly to me pretty significant, much more conservative than it was. Now whether that's the absence of the, the large labor influence or not, I don't know, but truly you counted on carrying Sedgwick County if you had a chance as a Democrat. You counted on carrying Southeast Kansas. Um, if you went back in history I don't know when you'd find the last, until recent years, Repu uh, Republican senator from Crawford County. Um, Jim Barone was the last Democrat senator from, the, aside from the particulars, um, the thing that in my, this will get me in trouble if I'm in the, anybody reads this, or, um, I think the Democrat Party in the state of Kansas, to the extent to which it has or had the potential to win elections, whether they be legislative, congressional, gubernatorial, um, relied on a much broader base um, of that was made up of labor, was made up of, of uh, minorities was made up of Catholics um, and um, over the last 10, 15 years I've observed that uh, the party has uh, taken more and more positions as though we were California or New York and uh, ultra liberal positions and has eroded the base tremendously. And almost by default, while it was a Republican state to begin with, um, it, it just handed to, uh, and I think nationally this is true too, handed so much of, well, what would be Trump's base? I don't think Trump personally any more ideologically held those views all of his life, but um, captured, you know, that significant base that uh, is strongly united on certain issues that much of which used to be part of the Democrat base and um, certainly in this state um, I mean I, I study demographics all the time and um, Leavenworth County my county is a good example um, you always Again, a candidate running, whether for the second district, for governor, for what have you, um, would count on carrying Leavenworth County, and it was uh, it was Democrat by registration by ten or more percent. It's it's no longer even Democrat by registration, and you can look at county after county after county that you used to count on. And you'd be amazed if you haven't looked at the demographics recently. Um, the different, it's Crawford County, again, as an example, is still by registration slightly Democrat. Nowhere near what it once was. What's the cause of all of that? I, I 
of views, personal views about it, some of which I've already expressed. Um, and uh, as a result of which I couldn't predict uh, this governor's race. Yeah. Um. I don't have any more questions. You, uh, anything you want to add for the, no, I, I don't, for the record? I don't know. I've enjoyed it very much. Um, probably went on way, way too long about things. And well, thank you for sitting down with us and mm -hmm. uh, walking through this. Thank you uh, for having me participate. Piece of history. I think it's a worthwhile project, and uh, whether anybody learns anything about it. <laughs> or whether any of us agree on anything. Uh, In time, your grandkids can flip on uh, the historical site and uh, yeah. find out what Grandpa did. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, I've enjoyed it, Ed, very Thank much. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you for your time.